Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for another very special edition of Wow's Alive. We're coming to you with Alex Meyer, the 2010 world champion in the 25K in one of the, the most exciting races I have ever seen. And uh, before we let Alex um, explain and describe the race itself, we're going to actually show you what happened in that race. And I'm going to share my screen, and then we're going to see the last 30 seconds of this race. It is, is actually really incredible. Just a moment. And uh, where is it? Eric is in the first position, always. Is he going to be able to maintain it? Let's applaud him, ladies and gentlemen. Let's applaud him. Alexander Meyer. We have a couple of points. Let's go. Stand to the side. Stand to the side. Let's go. 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 Valerio Trouvi, Alexander Meyer, le championnat du monde, un spectacle exceptionnel, Meyer, tu peux, Meyer, tu vois, c'est pas très connu, c'est du corps, ça va te dire, Alexander Meyer, nouveau champion du monde, Valerio Trouvi, médaille d'or, extraordinaire, et ça sert la main, I'm going to stop it there and uh, welcome Alex and uh, where are you calling in from? Thanks Steve. Uh, I am in Boston. I'm in my uh, apartment in the North End. So yeah. Uh, so that race was against Valero Clary at the time, you know, at the top swimmer in the world, in my opinion, he had just won the 10k race, beat guys like um, Thomas Lures and, and actually in that race, Peter Stoichev was third. Um, Incredible, incredible race. Can you take us, describe that race from start to finish? Yeah, and actually, um, thank you for your uh, the recap that you did uh, last week, uh, where you talked about uh, a few other races during that championships that were really exciting, but also the, the 25 uh, at, at length and actually brought brought some memories back uh, for me. So, so thank you for that. You did a good job there. Um, what I remember most uh, is so um you were right in saying that we're, we're kind of contrasting the uh the two and a half kilometer course with the you know the lac saint john actual like the traverse which is right. obviously can be some very rough waters out because you're actually crossing the lake but it was kind of both in that situation because as you know there's that rock jetty that kind of protects the inner harbor there yeah. but the course actually extended quite a bit past that so you had this interesting dynamic where about half of the course was pretty tranquil um but the the farther half um was actually really really rough that day and, and really choppy because it was kind of windy so you kind of had you were always going back and forth between both um sets of conditions which which makes things interesting um what i remember most in the beginning of the race was you know it mostly started off like any 25k which is uh you know pretty, pretty cruisy pace. Everyone just kind of just swimming along. Um, and I will actually quick diatribe, funny story. My first 25 K ever, which is at the 2009 world championships where I got disqualified about hundred meters from the finish, which you also touched on. Um, when we started that race, all I had ever done in my life was five Ks and 10 Ks. And all I knew was at the beginning of the race, when the horn goes off, you sprint to get the best <laughs> position. But in a 25K, I didn't really know it at the time, but things are a little different. Not only is the field size smaller, but the thing takes five to six hours to complete. So your positioning, you know, 30 seconds or a minute into the race really doesn't mean anything long in the long run. So I remember the horn going off and it was my first world championship race. And, you know, I was embarking on this, this journey and, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was, I was totally psyched up for this, for this race and horn goes off and I just start, I just, <laughs> start sprinting as hard as I can go and you know there's no one around me and, and I after 50 meters or 100 meters or so I, I look around and and I've got like probably you know I probably swam twice as far as everybody else and I, I'm just, I realized at that point I was like oh 
Yeah. Okay. I get that. That does make sense. That makes more sense. This is a long race. I guess I I have a question. So um, that morning when you woke up, what time did you wake up? What did you eat? Did you 2009 or 10? 2010. We'll talk about the Lake St. John. All right. So, so that story was from 2009. So fast forward to 2010, this is uh, in Lake St. John. Yes. And uh, as you mentioned, Valerio was kind of the man at that point, because he had won the 25 K the year before in 2009 and then won the 10 K at those championships. So he was kind of on top of the world um, at that point. So I don't remember what time the race went off. The sun was up. Um, that's all I really remember. So it was probably, but it's a long race. So it probably wasn't much later than like eight or nine in the morning. So it's yeah. usually 25 K days are very, very early wake ups. Like yeah. you're up at in the dark. Um, and I don't remember what I ate either. Um, usually, uh, nerves kind of got the best of my appetite so i always had to force food down um and just kind of like nibble on things as, as it got closer to uh the, the the start of the race uh but i, I don't i don't recall that I, I just remember it was probably at the one of the big long tables at the chateau rover ball yeah yeah and, uh, and so you were a little nervous you, there were, oh yeah yeah i was i mean like in a, in a good way not like you know, crying and, you know, vomiting and, yeah. want, you know, like shaking kind of nervous, but yeah, ner- definitely nervous. Yeah. And, and so- I felt like I had something to prove too, you know, like I, yeah. um, you know, with that DQ, I was basically pretty strongly in fourth position. The three, it was uh, Valerio and I don't remember the order, Brendan Capel and Trent Grimsey, but those, those are the top three finishers in 2009. And then there was probably a good minute or so, and then it was me and then probably another, maybe 30 seconds in, or so and Brian Reichman was behind me in fifth position about so I was pretty solidly in fourth and as much as I was disappointed uh in that I was also encouraged because I felt like hey you know it's actually not too bad you know for a first time right it's an international race first 25k world championship pretty much fourth place so yeah. and I remember telling um Catherine Boat uh our our, one of our coaches on the staff that year, as soon as I got out of the water that, um, you know, I was obviously super pissed off because, um, I got DQ'd and kind of adding fuel to the fire was that Valerio had won. And at the very beginning of the race, he, uh, let's just say he, um, got a little too physical with me in a, like a very strange way that I had never really experienced before. And it was pretty painful and, you know, there were no cards issued for that. And he'll deny it until the, you know, to the, to the end of his, till his dying day. But um, it happened and he went on to win the race. So I was like even more mad about that. Okay. Um, and this was also was after there was the whole fiasco with Frank Crippen when he went outside the finish shoot right. and there was that whole protest that took several days. And um, so like we had kind of, um, we Bad had blood. that protest and I think that maybe it was Valerio or another Italian that was kind of in the mix there that was hoping that he would have been disqualified so he could get a medal yeah um, so in a way I, I and I'm not accusing anybody of anything but I, I it felt like a retaliation against something that had happened earlier in the championships and it felt so unfair because also that card I, I ran into Shelly Clark from Australia totally by accident and it was at one of the buoys that was kind of on the far corner of the course. So I had, it was probably 1500 meters from the finish. Uh-huh. And it was not for another t- t- 12, th- you know, 13 minutes that I finally got the red card. So I was super confused. Uh-huh. Like, there's nobody even around me right now. Like, how can I be getting a red card for, like, I'm swimming by myself. Yeah. I, so anyway, I was frustrated. But I remember coming out of the water, I was like, Catherine, I am like beyond livid right now, but I think I can win next year. Yeah. Okay. Pretty fired up by that. So as much as it was this point, a result on paper, um, you know, it was super really encouraging for me. So I think I went into 2010 with more confidence than I did in, in 2009. Got it. Got it. So, so in Lake St. John, now we're in 2010, you do not yep. take off like it's a, no, no, no. so I got off to a nice, nice, easy start and, you know, it was pretty normal 25k for, you know, the first hour, maybe two hours, but then things start to heat up a little bit. And I remember specifically, um, Valerio and Eduardo Stocchino were um, both in the two Italian swimmers in the race. And I, 
I remember them working together very well. And there were, there were many uh, kind of, the, the, the pace naturally kind of tends to go up and down and up and down as, as the dynamics change and as people, you know, make moves or, or whatever. But they were very aggressive in essentially attacking the pack, the two of them and exchanging leads, which, you know, um, most of your viewers will probably know that, you know, it's an efficient way for, you know, a, a small group to kind of make a breakaway by sharing the lead and drafting off of one another. Um, so, and we, our, our team, our American team was pretty young at that time. And we honestly looked up to and really admired a lot of these, these other um, teams, especially the Europeans, because they just had so much more experience than us and they had been doing this for longer and they race more and it's much open water is much more uh, a, a part of, um, you know, their, their swimming community in, in federation. And they just, and that just that they've been doing it for longer and they take it a little bit more seriously and they're better at it. So we, we, we like races like that were great examples of, uh, of, um, you know, learning opportunities for us as a team to think about ways that we could, you know, just, be better in terms of not just our tactics, tactics individually, but a, as a team as well. Okay. So um, now you had a teammate. You had a teammate there, Joseph uh, Kinder yeah. Kinderwater. He, Kinderwater he guy, yeah. admittedly. Yeah. Did you and he ever, at least in the beginning, work together? I don't. I don't think that we had really. Again, like we were all kind of young and young and dumb, and like we, um, except for really like Fran, and well, that was pretty much it. Everyone yeah. else really knew. Um, Fran had been around for a while, but um, we just hadn't really gotten to that level yet. We hadn't really developed that, okay. that strategy. Okay. So it's so, you. No. Yeah, it's you, uh, Peter Stoichev, obviously, with his yep. track record and the Italians. Um, when, when, when did things start to heat up? Like, what was the cause of that, the pace to increase and then fall down? Yeah, so I would, I would say probably, probably about... 10 10 K in. So from probably that two hour starting at the two hour mark. And then for the, the following probably two hours, it was like a series of attacks where the, with every attack, you would lose a few stragglers. Right. So it, you, they would kind of attack 90% of the pack would catch up and then 10% would be lost. And they would kind of do that again. And it was just like almost just a war of attrition as 25 K is kind of yeah. tend to be anyway but they really, um, really pressed the gas on that, which made it a really interesting and, and difficult race, especially when you mix in the cold and the, the really choppy water. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, the course was also kind of, kind of a little bit oddly shaped, um, wasn't just a pure rectangle. Um, so over that kind of second two hours is where the pack really started to get spread apart. And then I remember, with about so with about two laps to go hang on a second i'm reliving this in my mind yeah with about two laps to go valerio had accumulated a pretty significant lead like i want to say 30 to 40 seconds or something oh, really like that. Oh, okay yeah and he was like way way out front and i was with a group of like maybe three or four other people at that point uh -huh and was trying to you know get us to work together and i was kind of taking the lead and trying to push the pace to catch up to him but they just like weren't they just weren't doing anything so yeah. every open water swimmer that's done especially like 10k and above races has to come to terms with that decision at some point where it's like do i just need to like is it worth working with these guys and kind of staying here and try to make this thing happen as a as a group or do i just cut time, you know, cut your losses and just like, cause time's ticking. Right. And just yeah. go for it and try to catch up on your own. Um, so that's the decision that I made at that point, after trying to kind of foment this like pack strategy to, to catch up to Valerio, it just wasn't working. These guys were clearly pretty gassed. So I was like, all right, I guess I'm on my own for this one. So um, on here um, now for people who don't know, I mean, you're swimming in this pack. Are you looking at guys? I mean, are you like giving them some kind of eye signal or, you know, like speeding up for five strokes, slowing down and, and mentioning it, you know, moving your arms or how do you, how are you communicating with this pack? It, that, it, for races like that, where it's spread out enough, the race is long enough and the, pack, and the average pace is slow enough, 
you can kind of just grab someone on the arm and say, and just speak to them. Got it. Uh, that's harder to do in like a, a 5k, obviously, right. because it's the pack stays together almost the whole time. There, there isn't that like nuanced level of strategy uh-huh. and you just, you know, the amount of the, the, the ground you lose by stopping treading water for a second and trying to communicate a message to somebody is like actually significant yeah. where 25 K it doesn't really matter. Got it. Got it. So at, at that point in that race and with longer races in general, that's kind of how you do it. Like yeah. there's no wink and nod kind of yeah. stuff. Going on. Got it. Got it. Um, so I, I took, it took me about probably a full lap almost to, to, kept, to um, cover this gap. Okay. okay. So I broke away from these guys. I'm just going, going alone and I'm going to, I'm going to see if I can reel, reel Valerio in. And he's a really fit guy and he's obviously an incredible athlete and was at the, probably the peak of his career at that point. So it was not, it was not a, uh, an easy task, but I eventually caught up to him with probably like a lap and change to go. So I get on his feet and now is he surprised? Do you think at this point? Well, that's the interesting part is that, so now I'm, I'm like getting this, you know, adrenaline surge. I'm like in the zone, I'm amped up. I'm also completely exhausted um, because I've been swimming, you know, probably a couple seconds per hundred faster than him for the last probably half an hour, maybe yeah. even more. So I'm, it's like a very welcome break for me to just kind of like sit on his feet and just draft a little bit. And that now I'm like thinking of like what happened last year between us and this like whole beef that we have. And I'm just like, Oh man, like this would be like such a great win for me. You know, like, I just, I just want to just kick this guy's ass so bad. Um, and, but and as I kind of, I'm swimming along there and I'm just drafting off of him and it, after, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes goes by it. I'm like, why is he, if you know anything about Valerio, he's not the type of guy to just like, let you sit behind him, sit on his feet and draft off of him. It's just not really how he operates. Um, so I start thinking, actually, you know what? I'm pretty sure he doesn't even know that I'm right here. Really? Oh, wow. Because because there's just no way that he wouldn't turn around or like move over or do a little zigzagging or like, straight up stop and tell me, tell me to just, okay, your turn now, pal, you know, kind of thing. So I'm like, I should probably just make sure I don't touch his toes because okay. that would be a dead right giveaway. Yeah. I want to, I want to educate our audience um, yeah. in these world championship races, in these loop courses at 25 K there are, there are not coaches right next to you. There's not an escort boat like the Traverse. Traverse say when you cross the lake, there's always your, your boat, your, your coach right next to you. And they always are communicating in these 25 K races. There's a feeding station way down at the other end and the finish. And so athletes are truly by themselves. So when you, when you say, you know, after five hours or so, Valerio doesn't know you're there. He doesn't have any coaches to tell the, him they're right. there. So I just wanted yeah. to put that in place. So yeah. And, 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 from his perspective, he probably felt like, okay, I held this pace and I created this rather large gap. If I can just hold this pace, it's very unlikely that anyone is going to make up such a significant gap. Um, So he, it wasn't really, um, it's not like a dig at him or anything. Like he was doing the right thing. Like with, you know, you've got this much energy left in the bag. Like you just want to put it on, if you, if you've been on cruise control and creating a gap, just keep doing that. Don't, you don't need to like over, don't overdo it because yeah. it could be, you could shoot yourself in the foot by doing that. So anyway, and um, you know, educating the viewers, you want to drafting behind somebody is the most efficient way to get a good draft, especially if it's more than one or two people. Um, and you want to get as close as you can to their feet and without really touching them. So, I mean, in a lot of times you still do, and that's totally acceptable. Like just in the, in the sport, like you're going to have your feet touch. If you're pushing on someone's feet and yanking and, you know, grabbing their heels or whatever, that's a different story, but it's totally normal and acceptable to like kind of occasionally, you know, brush their, 
toes or the bottoms of their feet or something like that, just the way, just the way it is. So I, um, you know, it's almost like cyclists are like their wheel, you know, you from a, for a non-cyclist, even like me to, to watch like the Tour de France or something, how close they get. And just like, wow, that looks like, that's like really intense, really close, really kind of dangerous, but we kind of do the same thing swimming. Yeah. Um, although going a lot slower and not going to fall off and hit solid ground. So um, anyway, I decide best not to give my position away by touching his feet, because that would be very obvious that I'm here and we're, we're going into the final lap. So we kind of go around and we skip the feeding station. I'm pretty sure. Oh, okay. Otherwise, I feel like his coach would have been like, Hey, there's someone behind you. Um, so I kind of, you know, I'm kind of standing a, a foot or so behind and we kind of go around. We're onto the 10th of 10 laps now and probably about four or 500 meters into the lap. I like just barely with oh. the tip of my fingernail, like brush like his pinky toe or something. <laughs> and he immediately stops, like stops dead in the water. And it's just the two of us at this point. Peter is probably about a minute, minute and a half behind. Uh -huh. um, and he like, again, I have a lot of respect for, for Valeria uh, uh, as an athlete. And I think our personal relationship has, has warmed over the years. But at that point I was like, there are, there are very few people in the sport that I can say, like I am legitimately afraid of, like, like I have not, like they, 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 just, they scare me. Like they're, they just are physically imposing or just like v Valerio was one of those guys. So when he stopped and just like looked at me in the eyes, the way that he did, I don't think I, there are a few times in my life that I've been like more scared than that. So I was like, okay, I'll take the lead now. So I, you know, I keep swimming and and kind of confirmed my theory that he didn't know I was there. So anyway, we're kind of swimming along, but, and I kind of take the lead, but we're kind of doing a lot of this, like just kind of side by side, or like, we're basically, we're on our own. We're not working together really at this point. So we go around the final feed station on the far side on this course, there were two feeding stations per lap. You know, we grab a drink, kind of just moseying along, like not really in a hurry. Um, Cause it's basically we've locked in gold and silver at this point. Um, and it, so we kind of round and we're now we're, we're coming back. So we're looking at maybe 1500 meters to go or maybe a little bit less. And there are a couple times where I felt like, okay, I am just like, both of us are at our breaking point right now. Like okay. we, we are running on absolute fumes. So in my mind, even though I'm hurting like that, it just, my philosophy of racing in general like that is the best time to attack and like really try to make a breakaway because even if, even if you might kind of die too, you have the psychological effect of um, basically like just ruining someone's spirit by like, if you can, if you can launch a successful, you know, get just like a, a, a certain amount, there's like a critical amount of distance you need to have where they kind of will give up. So that was my, strategy is like, I just need to put in a solid, like 200 meter effort here to get enough distance on him where he kind of, where he kind of gives up. And then I can kind of ratchet it back a little bit so that I don't completely die. Um, and I essentially can maintain that same spread for the, for the remaining yeah. you know, 200 meters or whatever it was. So that I would like kind of, I did this thing where I kind of count, I count down strokes and be like, all right, I'm going to go in four three, two, like one strokes. And then I would just start to hit it and I would kick and I'd turn up my tempo and I, and, and that would, that would last for like 15 meters. And I'd just be like, I can't, like, I just, I just can't, like, I have nothing left to give. Um, so, and I tried that a couple of times over this last 1200 meter stretch or so. And I just was not able to get any meaningful amount of speed in, increase or um, distance ahead of Valerio. So really it comes into the final turn buoy where you turn left and then the finish line is about 200 meters away. And I kind of, at this point, we, I, I tuck behind, um, behind him again and I, I'm on his feet. And at this point, it's a little bit different dynamic than having an hour left to go in the race where if you only have 200 meters left to go or hundred meters left to go, 
a body length lead is now significant where in the middle of a 25 K it doesn't mean anything. Um, so this is a situation where, you know, someone like Valerio, Valerio might actually let me take that position because he said, fine, you're drafting, but I have a body length lead on you. Yeah. So it's, it's, um, that was the situation we're in. And I, you know, at some point I'm just kind of planning my attack. I was like, I have literally, I have one probably 25 meter sprint left in me. That's it. And I need to use it wisely. So I kind of waited and waited until, you know, maybe a hundred or a little bit, maybe a little bit less uh, to go thinking that if I could just put in that 25 meter sprint, get the body length lead on him, um, then maybe do some defensive maneuvering to just like keep him behind me that I can, then I'll win. Um, so I try to go around one side, you know, I'm, I'm back here, he's up here and I try to go around this side and he cuts me off and I go around, kind of hop over his leg and, and uh, like to your point, Yes, they had been harsh on the officiating. So as soon as he did that, I I, remember, I don't know if you can see it in the video, but I like put my hands up like yeah. this because I, like, I did not do anything here. Like my hands are in the air and like almost like a water polo player. Yeah. So um, so he kind of kind of really really cut me off, and then I, which made me uh, kind of go over uh, his legs a bit. Um, you know, I kind of did one of these, and now I'm on the other side. And I don't remember if he cut me off again or not, but I think that the thing at that point was one, I just, I just had the ability to go to that extra gear when I was really, really exhausted. And that was one of the things I think was one of kind of my defining, um, you know, strengths was that basically the longer and harder the race was my last hundred meter or 50 meter sprint is affected less than most other people. So it's in my best interest for the race to be as difficult and strenuous and fast as possible. So I think that I had a leg up on him just because I, I was able to go to that. I was a little younger and, you know, uh, quicker and I could go to that gear quicker than he could. But also he, at that point, I think was more focused on where I was in relation to him than where he was in relation to the finish line. So you, when you're cutting someone off like that, like it is definitely a strategy. It is not a long-term strategy where like you can, you can't keep doing that for like a hundred meters. It's eventually that person's going to get around you, but you can kind of cut someone off and fend off like for maybe 20 meters or 25 meters or so. Um, you can kind of fend off someone trying to come up your side. So the thing was, we were just too far from the finish for that to really be an effective strategy. Um, and he lost track of where ultimately he was trying to get to as soon as possible, which was the finish line. He was more concerned about where I was. So he was, he, and you kind of, if you're doing that, you have to keep both in mind. Um, and sometimes it's not worth, depending on the angles and everything, it's not really worth cutting someone off again because now you're swimming like away from the finish line and, and then they're just going to hop over you. Now they have like the clear line to the finish and you're going off to the Atlantic ocean or something. Um, so that's basically what happened. I, I was, I finally kind of, it was far enough from the finish where I was able to kind of get, get the, get on his side where it didn't make sense for him to really cut me off anymore because then he would be going the wrong way. Um, and then I just kind of snit and was able also just to sprint faster than him. So, yeah. um, so I did, uh, it was great. That I mean, was satisfying, yeah. satisfying win. And not just because of like, we had this little beef or whatever from last year, but because there, I, I won, I felt like I really won an inner battle within myself that day, because there were a couple of times where I was like, I mentioned, I was trying to like, you know, drop the hammer and create a gap. And I just could not physically do it where I started to talk myself into, is like, Hey, you know, like, dude, you got a silver medal like that at world championships. Like that's really good. But like, you know, second place is really good too. And like, that is true, but is a really, really, um, it is the wrong attitude to have when the race isn't even over yet. So I was anyway, I, in a way I was kind of like, it was like this fight or flight response led to like me bargaining with myself and saying, and it's a natural reaction that your, you know, your body when it's in extreme pain or discomfort or lack of energy 
reserves. Like he's kind of tell your mind, you know, kind of tells your, your body has this instinctual evolutionary response to like shut down. And that includes your thoughts as well. So like, I think I did a really good job of like fighting those thoughts and saying, Nope, race is not over. We are not going to just like get second place or accept second place. If that's what happens, then yeah, obviously I'll be proud of that. And that's like a huge accomplishment, but like, you can't think that way. Like you have to fight, fight, fight like the whole way all the way until the end, until the race is over. Um, so in that, and sometimes that's really, really hard to do when you're in extreme discomfort. Um, so that was actually probably what I was most proud of was that I just fought through those really negative thoughts and wanting to kind of give up and wanting to just like re reel it back, ratchet it back and just, um, and I, and I didn't. So that was a really, really huge moment, uh, for me in, in my, in my career and in, and in my life and, you know, contributed to, um, you know, the part of my relationship, not contributed, made a huge impact on my relationship with Robival and Lock St. John and why I decided to end there in 2016 and, and that whole thing. So it was a pretty pivotal, pivotal um, win uh, in race in general in, in, in my career. Yeah, no, it was great. I mean, that last 25, when you finally turned the corner on him, finally, I mean, it was like you were being chased by a shark. I mean, you're- Yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty wild. Yeah. yeah. I, I wish that, uh, that, um, Maruf could, uh, could, uh, held the camera a little more still, but I totally understand why he didn't. <laughs> yeah. And, and then what, what I also liked about that, uh, footage, we, we cut it off toward the end, but you finished the race, uh, both you and him, like the gentleman, I know, I mean, he must've been really amped up and disappointed and psyched and everything, but you, you know, like gentlemen, you shook hands, mm -hmm. but then the water at the finish line at Lake St. John, it is shallow. You just walked around and you were like a heavyweight fighter who had just won the world championships. You were splashing, yeah. you were waving to the crowd. You, you had your hands on your hips. I mean, you look like, man, I did it. Yeah. Yeah. That was, it's, that's what we live for, right? We put in all these hours of training and like, you know, excruciatingly painful races like this for like those few moments of triumph and, and, uh, you know, and then you kind of wipe the, wipe the slate, slate clean and, and, you know, pretend it never happened and like, you know, kind of move on to the next thing, which is both a blessing and a curse, but it's what, you know, that quality is what makes great athletes great. And, but still like, yeah, there's that, there's that moment of, of just kind of like soaking it all in and just like appreciating and just like living in the moment where you're just like, hell yeah, I just did that. And that this is awesome. Yeah. Or, yeah. Before we get on to the next stage in your open water swimming evolution, I, I do want to go back to that 2016 victory where you go back to Lake yep. St. John and you do the traditional 32, 32 K crossing. Um, can you explain that victory? Yeah. Um, so I, in 2015, um, for those that don't know, the open water Olympic selection process is a little convoluted and um, it's a multi-step process. And basically long story short, I, I knew in 2015 at the world championships when Sean and Jordan qualified for Rio that I, that meant that I basically did not have a chance anymore of, of making the 2016 team, which I, I really wanted because I felt like 2012 just didn't, I like, I just didn't, uh, I didn't achieve there what I really wanted to and thought that I was capable of, um, partly due to, or actually in large part due to my collarbone, uh, injury that I had that the earlier that year. Um, but you know, I just, I, ever since then, I've always like made like 2016, I'm like, I'm going to show the world in 2016 that basically I, you know, I, um, you know, and w w one of the best, if not the best 10K swimmer in the world, right? So, but that didn't happen. Um, and I was kind of in this place where I had to decide what to do. Um, and I, um, in, a, in a way, it was a blessing because um, I had some bucket list items that I just wasn't really able to ever check off because they just didn't really fall in line with what I needed to do to maximize my chances of 
um, making the Olympic team in, in, in winning a medal at the Olympics in the 10 K. So then that, that included things like, um, uh, Lock St. John. So it's a 32 K swim, a lot of, you know, different training it's in July, which is, you know, coincides with a lot of other big championships. And I just never was able to really, really train for it and focus on that race. But it, I always, re, it was, it was a big kind of unchecked box for me because one, I, I felt the sense of regret for not doing it in 2010 because they invited me as soon as I won the 25 K they invited me to do it the following week or it was like a week and a half later or something like that. And at the time I didn't really appreciate what the Traverse was like, what an institution it was. And to, and it's, it's hard to put it to words and you kind of have to go there and experience it for yourself. But this is like their super, the Traverse is like their Super Bowl in, in rubber ball. In this town of 10,000 people is all of a sudden 50,000 people for the whole week leading up to this race. And it's got a ton of, uh, it's got, you know, 65, 70 years of history behind it. And it is the pride and joy of um, this, uh, this town and really this region. And it is like, everybody knows the Traverse is. Um, the uh, Danny LaBelle, the former mayor of Riverball, uh, told me even that every year there are children born who are named after winners of the Traverse. It is like that much of a, a thing there. Like people take the whole week oh. off work and they have parties and they have parades and they get drunk on their lawns and they like, it, it's a whole celebration. And, it, and uh, they do the dinner in the streets on the Wednesday before where like the whole town, literally the whole town has like breaks bread together and has dinner together. They set out all these long picnic tables and the, down the, they closed all the streets off for cars and they have like, it, it's, it's insane. Like it, it is, I've never seen a, a spectacle like this around an open water swimming race in my life. Um, so, but in 2010, I didn't really appreciate that. And Paul Asmuth, who was a, a huge mentor of mine and really, uh, obviously, uh, incredible marathon swimmer in his own right back in the, you know, eighties and nineties. Um, he kind of told me about it, but I didn't really get it. Um, so I, I declined to, to swim it. Cause I was like, Hey, I just won the 25 K world championship. I'm super sore. And I have to do, I had pan, pan packs about a month maybe a month and change later, which was actually, that's where we had to, that's where we were qualifying for funding. So I like, I needed to put together a really good 10 K um, just to be able to like make money and continue my career. Um, so I said, no, but um, you know, and after I learned more about it and especially what the event itself was, but also how much it meant to Paul, who was someone who met and, and who means a lot to me. Um, and also just the, the, um, status that this race has within the overall marathon swimming community where it's like the Wimbledon of you know of open water swimming it's like a marquee event it's the it's the it's the big deal race um so all those factors combine to give me the sense of like okay I really need to do this race at some point like I, I need and I, and I need to win um and ideally set a set a record too so, uh, but it just never really happened. And then, but until 2015, where I was like, maybe this is, maybe this is for the better. And I can take a year to just train for Lock St. John, maybe a couple other things that I have always wanted to do, but just haven't really been able to fit into my schedule. Um, so that's what I did. Um, and I always kind of had a deal with Paul where because Paul was always kind of like, like nagging me to like, oh, you should do Lock St. John this year. Oh, you should do Lock St. John this year. Like, and I uh, always said, I can't this year, but if I do, the only way I'm doing it is if you're in my boat. So as you alluded to earlier, this actually is one of those races where every swimmer will have their own escort boat going alongside them. And you have a boat captain, which is um, chosen by lottery. We're in front of big crowds after the dinner in the streets, you go up on stage and there's a band and lights and lasers and smoke machines and everything. And then you put, you pull, uh, each athlete goes up one by one, pulls a name out of a hat and that's the name of your, uh, boat captain. Um, uh, and I pulled, uh, Francois Bouillet, who interestingly enough was a captain was Paul's boat captain. Oh, okay. And, uh, one of his, one or two of his races in the eighties that he won. Oh, okay. Uh, so that was cool. 
and and uh, and uh, of course Paul Paul was my my coach. So he, Paul came to be uh, to my my feeder and you know giving me all the information I needed and everything during during the race. Um, so that's how that kind of started. Um, and, uh, or, or at least that's how, that's like the, the kind of the, the background to why I decided to do the, do the race. So I took that year to really train more specifically. I was in Knoxville at the time, train more specifically for the longer distance. And really it was just about, I, I knew my career was going to end. Um, and I just wanted to end it in like just the most meaningful way possible. And like, have like, and I felt like Lock St. John, you know, meant a lot to me. And in a way it would almost be like bookends on my career, right? Like I feel like a really big moment for me was winning that 25 K in Robert vault in 2010. And that really like launched me to another level where I was like really super confident and really thought I could make an Olympic team and gave me the confidence to actually like go out and do this professionally and like not try to find a job and do all that, you know, stuff that normal people do. Um, so that was kind of like the beginning. And I felt like, wouldn't it just be perfect to, to go back, do the 32K, win it, and have that kind of just be the end. And it would just be like this nice, neat little, you know, right? right? <laughs> and um, so that's what I did. And, and also kind of taking that a step further, when I was a young kid, like 12, I grew up in Ithaca, New York, and I had a coach named Roy Staley, um, who used to take us up, take his team up to um, – the summer camp in, in Ontario, Canada called, uh, the boys camp was Camp Chicopee. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the girls camp was Camp Accomac on the other side of Amic Lake. Um, and the camp was actually start, uh, started by Matt Mann. Um, and it was, you know, back in the day, you know, summer camps were more of a, a thing that people did. And this summer camp was, um, and I always went to summer camp when I was a young kid too, it was a YMCA camp, not anything to do with swimming, but it was a part of my life. It's part of my big part of my dad's life um, when he was growing up too. So, um, you know, I went to Chicopee for one, one summer for like a couple of weeks as a 12 year old, because Roy brought us all up there because this camp was really focused on swimming in particular, a lot of open water swimming as a big part of the camp curriculum. So, and I was also needing to train in cold water a little bit more than, than usual to prepare for Lac St. John because it can be really cold, especially in the beginning when you're going down the Parabanca and you're not yet into the, the larger lake. Um, so I thought, hey, wouldn't that be perfect to just go hang out at Camp Chicopee for a month, train there in cold water. I can, you know, coach these kids, mentor these kids, hang out with them, play some Frisbee here and there, eat in the dining hall, you know, whatever, do that whole thing. Um, and it was kind of like back going back to my roots in a little different way where, you know, I was there as a 12 year old and my first open water race was from Camp Accomac, um, to this, I don't know, some, the end of Amic Lake somewhere. It was like two and a half miles or something. And I won that race. So, um, I'm like, as you can probably sense, I'm a pretty sentimental person. And I, I like, you know, I, I get caught up in that stuff a lot. So to me, that was like the perfect way to do the summer was go to Camp Chicopee, train, kind of give back a little bit to these to some of these kids and, and just enjoy being with them and um, and with Colette and Bob Dunkel, who were running the camp um, and and then go right from there to Lock St. John. Uh, so that's what I did. Um, and everything worked out uh, really well. I um, I won the race, but, you know, it was not without some very low lows, um, it, about a couple of hours into the race, I was so cold. Um, I have never been colder in my life and I just was having a really hard time just in general, emotionally, physically. Um, I was so cold. I could like, I couldn't pee, which it sounds kind of, kind of goofy, but like yeah. that's actually really important skill to have in, in these long races is you have to be able to like pee while you while you're swimming without losing a huge amount of ground so that was like really challenging and really discouraging and like it's almost like it's one of those things where the fact that it's hard makes it even harder so it's like this whole mental block thing that I always kind of struggled with but um whatever so there was that and um uh, in that at that point, did Paul Asmuth, as your trainer on your escort, did he help in any way? Did he 
or is it just I, yourself in your head? I asked him to, to uh, yeah, he gave me some, he said, you know, try increasing your stroke rate, try kicking more. I asked him to warm up my feeds because he had a bottle of like, um, of like really hot water. Mm -hmm. So you could kind of modulate the temperature of the, the feeds. Uh -huh. you know, that's when he gave me was like way too hot. And I remember like spitting it out. I was like, too hot, too hot. Take this back. Um, uh, actually, I think I just dunked a little bit of the lake water in it to cool it down and, and drank it. But um, so, and well, after the, so he, he did what he could. Um, and after the fact, he, he told actually my mom that he was like, I was very, very concerned for, for Alex, because as you know, Paul actually in, in one of the years that Block St. John was a 64 K actually, I think it was the first year that it was a 64 K he blacked out. He had a hypothermic blackout and someone had, someone had to grab him, scoop him out of the water. So I'm sure having been in that situation himself, he knows the signs and he's obviously, you know, cares a lot about me too. So I'm sure it was a stressful um, situation for him to be in a, as a coach and, um, so, uh, but eventually, you know, the part of the problem was we had been on the river, which is colder. Um, and it, the sun had, it was still very overcast. So there was no solar radiation coming in to kind of make you feel a little bit warmer. So I just remember like basically being two minutes from getting out for about like an hour and a half or maybe two hours where I basically say, all right, just swim for two more minutes and then you can get out. And then you kind of swim for two minutes and then you tell yourself again, just swim for two more minutes and then you can get out. So I don't know. It's kind of just, uh, it's like swim or like run to the rock. Okay. You get to the rock. All right. Run to the tree. Okay. It's like the, the mind had the mind. It's easier for the mind to comprehend or, um, or be up for a challenge if you kind of chop it up into smaller pieces. So that was just, a mental strategy that I employed for in, in many instances is just don't look, don't think about how far you are from the finish. Just like get to the next buoy, right? And okay, you get to the next buoy. And then you kind of have to just find ways to trick your mind into keeping going. <laughs> and that's just something I, I learned over time. And, and I was able to use that, you know, mental fortitude in, in this case, where eventually the, you know, the sun, sun came out and I finally kind of got back into my rhythm. I was warming up and feeling better and then was able to like because i always felt like a distance like 25 32 k the only thing the only reason why anyone as long as i could pee without having to stop and i could not get way too hot or way too cold and i'd be in a comfortable temperature then basically i think i could be anybody anytime in any set of conditions right but those were like the couple things that were always the, not Achilles heel, but like the, I guess the risk factors. And maybe the, maybe the, the peeing thing was like a little bit of a, a Achilles heel, but, um, and as part of why I lost those three, the three medalists in 2009, they away from me, I was with them and I, 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 lo I lost a huge gap on them because of that very reason. But um, anyway, I, so, you know, things start just picking up and everything, things are starting to go my way. And then um, at one point, like, this just tells you like what a little bit more about like Paul as a human being and just like what a great guy he is and an amazing mentor. But I remember at one point he, we have the little um, whiteboards, right. Where he would put notes or information or so-and-so is so far in front or so far behind. And he put wrote on there and you know, he's a pretty spiritual guy. So he wrote, um, um, he wrote, uh, you know, son is with you. Um, waves are with you, uh, family is with you. And, and for me, that was a, that like, that was a, I got a lot of energy from that, like really positive energy. And that, that's like exactly what I needed at that point in the race. Cause I was like, just starting to feel better. And, and I, and as soon as I saw that, I was like, I was, it was over. Like, you know, I was, I was there, you know, and my like shoulder was killing me at that point too. And like, that's just what I needed to, kind of get into that zone and just like feel and, and, and really that says a lot about like what this race meant and it was like it was really a, it was a it was symbolic for me it was about not just it was not just winning a race and you know, making some money and you know putting something on my my resume but it was about what Lock, Lock St. John has done for me in terms of like inspiring my career what 
the bond that Paul and I, you know, forged over this process, you know, how um, meaningful, you know, Lock St. John and Robovall as a community just became to me by, um, you know, really shaping my career. The fact my family was there because they cared so much. And, you know, like, it was just like that race was about so much more than just that race for me. Um, and I think that that was, that added so much, um, you know, inspiration and, and motivation that um, just put, you know, push, push me along and, and um, enabled me to, to win and have a really good time. Um, and, and one other thing I, I do remember is I, I, I had a very gracious host named Sebastian Tremblant. Uh, I stayed at his house for like a week and a half. And uh, I remember at one point, and I didn't realize it was him until after, but um, one of the cool things about Lock St. John is as you go, you start super early in the morning, but as the race goes along, there'll be a lot of boats that are just kind of alongside the pack that are just like, you know, people out having a good time in their own boats and just watching the race, right? So you, you get, it gets to the point where at the end of the race, there were like 200 boats out there, just like people in their little boats, you know, or big boats or whatever. Um, that are watching this race because everyone knows what's going on. And there, at one point, there was a pretty nice looking big boat that was going by that had a huge American flag on the front. And that's where I was just like, yes, yes. And I was like, I don't know, 400 meters from the finish at that point. And I was just like, so I had never been like so fired up in the middle of a race ever in my life. And it was just like the perfect ending to not just that race, but, you know, my, my career really. Yeah. Yeah. Now you didn't, that race you, you won with plenty to spare. You did go down to a uh, touch with uh, Valero Cleary, correct? No, 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 no. I think uh, Eduardo Stokino actually, um, who was in that 25 K in 2010. Um, he wasn't super far behind. I don't know, maybe a minute or a couple minutes or something like that. Um, yeah. Enough time where kind of like going into the finish you know, I, around that last buoy, um, you know, I kind of enjoy it and just talk to Paul for a second. I just said, thank you, Paul. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Oh, that's good. You, you were able to enjoy that last swim. Yeah. With the Soaked it all in. Crowd. Yeah. And, and, you know, one, one thing that I uh, also just remembering now is that um, another thing that was really special and meaningful to me was that I got a sense that my career meant something to other people because I remember, um, uh, Davy Bilyau from Belgium. Um, I think he had dropped out of the race because I remember him telling me um, that, like, watching me come in to the finish. He was think he was like, "Yeah, man." And I was I was watching you swim, and I was just thinking, "Wow, like these are this is just not just the last race, but this is like the last few hundred meters, you know, of your career." And he like that he was watching that race through that kind of like within that context from that perspective thinking about these are the last few hundred meters that you know alex meyer is gonna you know really compete like in his professional career yeah. i just thought that was really cool that he shared that he thought that and that he shared that with me because i was like wow that it's kind of nice to know that you know my my career had somewhat of an impact on other other people you know besides just me <laughs> so i want I want to shift gears now because you're now giving back to the sport. Uh, we've talked about Fran Crippen and, and for mm -hmm. those listeners who don't know, Fran is the only athlete in, in the 115 years of FINA history who passed away during a competition. Um, he was one of your closest friends. Um, we've also talked about hypothermia. We talked about Paul Asmuth blacking out due to the cold yep. water and someone having to fish him out. Talked about yourself in, in being really, really cold. I mean, cold down to the bone. Yep. And we talked about escort boats and officials and eyes on swimmers. Um, and now you're working with a company that has a technology that has really changed the parameter or the, the, the paradigm, the safety paradigm in the sport. Um, I noticed your shirt says wave. Can you yep. introduce what uh, you're doing with wave? Yeah. So um, there, after Fran died, everything changed. I mean, for, for me and like, it, it's almost ironic in a way that Fran cared about these issues 
uh, you know, in his lifetime where it wasn't really something that I thought about um, on a daily, on a daily basis and was like overly concerned with, whereas Paul or, or with, whereas Fran was actually, you know, going to convention and serving on committees and doing all these, um, this advocacy for safety in, in general in the sport. And ultimately he was a casualty of lack of safety in our sport. So, you know, that, that changed, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of things for me where I started to, um, you know, get a little bit more involved in some of the governance with USA swimming and, um, just kind of speaking out about my experience and how I think the sport could improve. And, um, sometimes that meant taking shots at, um, some people or organizations like, like FINA, even though, you know, we're all, all grateful for the, you know, this, you know, this, this, the sport that they, and the, the structure that they've created, but at the same time, there's a lot of issues there too. Um, so anyway, there are, there are a lot of ways to tackle the problem of, or the issue, I guess, of, of um, swimming safety and in, also in a couple different ways, like there's competitive swimming kind of safety and um, where it's, um, it's rules and regulations and um, sometimes uh, equipment, you know, solutions like now I think Fino has a rule. This is after my time, but I think they have a rule or below a certain temperature, like you can wear a wetsuit of a certain type or thickness or whatever, right? So there are um, rules and regs, there's equipment, and now there's, um, or, or maybe apparel, I should say. Um, and then uh, there's also tech, there's a technological, now, now with what Wave is doing, there's a technological component as well. Um, where, um, you know, we have the ability now to create uh, a, a system of devices and receivers that can detect um, a, a, a potential drowning incident. Um, so, you know, obviously it's an issue that it's really close to my heart. It has applications, I think, for both the competitive and the, you know, just like recreational swimming space, whether it's backyard pools or community pools or water parks or whatever, um, where I think, you know, this, this um, technology could be imp implemented um, widely and save, you know, save a lot of, save a lot of lives um, every year. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're off to a great start. I am not an engineer that I'm not that there are a couple people with the, that are the, the brilliant brains behind how this system works but um, essentially it's a it's a wearable uh, tracker they call them that goes just like fits kind of on your actually oh I don't have any um, goes like right on your head kind of sits on your temples you don't even know that it's there um, they also they have like a the the actual functional technology is a small piece about this big so, and they do make little uh, clips that you can click them onto like a, a goggle strap or something like that but I find that it's not even really worth it's not right, not even really worth it because the the tracker. Uh, it's almost like imagine like a headband, but like all the way back here. Um, it's so uninvasive that like I it doesn't really bother me at all. So um, th there's potentially some um, there can be some innovation there in terms of like making it smaller and and um, you know lower profile or whatever. But it's really um, negligible, and uh, you know you wear this device. It communicates with a central hub or like kind of receiver that works via Bluetooth. Um, and it can uh, basically when the, when the um, tracker is submerged, it does not, it can't transmit that Bluetooth signal through water. So when the hub recognizes that it's not, not receiving a, a signal, which is, I think they do two a second or something like that. Um, if it's not getting pings from this from this tracker, it, it'll send off. And there, there's a couple other, a couple other factors in there, but it'll basically trigger an alarm where you know not only the hub itself has a, a, a sounds an alarm, it has a has a light on it, but also they've got a couple other things in the works where um, right now, actually, we already have uh, a uh, wristband that uh, a lifeguard could wear. So like at a local town beach or something like that. Um, they, the, the, the wristband, if there was a drowning incident that it was detecting would, would vibrate. So they would get, you know, kind of a second level of, of alert there. Um, and then also, and this is um, it kind of in the, in the prototype phase, um, but there, um, 
we're working on location indicators. So again, picture like your local town beach. You could say you had like 10 of these things spaced out along like the, uh, the lane lines that go that marks the swimming area or even in the middle of the swimming area. If there was a drowning incident occurring, the, the, the little buoy thing that is closest to where that oh, okay. body is will light up. So in a pool, you know, you kind of, you have the luxury uh, in a clean pool, you have the luxury of being able to pretty much see to the bottom, um, which makes life saving and, and rescue a lot easier. But even still, when there are a lot of people in the pool and the water is, you know, choppy or, you know, maybe it's a little cloudy, you know, you can't, even in a pool setting, you can't always immediately identify where that person is, even more so in open water. So, we think that this is going to be like a really big step function in, in terms of the capability of the system um, because it can not only detect the drowning, but also give you a, a, a general indication of where to start looking. So that's, that's like the, the latest thing that they're, that they're working on now. Um, Got it. So just, just to summarize for the listeners. So basically you put on something on your goggles or sitting on your head. Yep. Um, and if, for whatever reason you are submerged, you go under the water for some period of time, it could be, I don't know, one second, 10 seconds, whatever, that triggers an alert. And then that alert informs the lifesaver or whoever is on the beach to go toward that individual to yep. save. Okay. Exactly. Who's, who's involved with this company? Um, so uh, it was started by uh, Dave Cutler and Mark Karen. Okay. Um, Dave, uh, Dave's more the engineer. Uh, Mark is more the you know uh, fundraiser business uh, guy, and um, Dave had developed a, a similar product I I in the past that we I think we used some of that some of that technology to really just uh, you know 10x the the capability and, and kind of transforming it into this new product. Got it. And and um, and we're there. Um, we are, you know, starting to get some traction uh, with sales, uh, looking for investors, hoping to do uh, to raise another round soon um, to just um, to to be able to just to build our, our, our inventory, just to make more product um, and also to streamline that process because it's a little it's a little manual um, and, and clunky right now. So um, so that's that's what we're trying to do. And uh, and also just as it relates to open water. Um, uh, we are exploring. So in this whole COVID um, situation, uh, we had a lot of pool closures, obviously. So a lot of teams were kind of left um, not really uh, knowing what to do with, you know, their teams and because they can't get pool space or it's really expensive or whatever. And uh, there's a, a local team, uh, uh, Crimson Aquatics, uh, here, one of the, one of the branches of, of, of um, Crimson Aquatics, and the head coach there is Peter Zieger, and we've been working with him. They actually uh, purchased a, a system from us because they've been doing uh, a lot of work in open water, regularly scheduled practices, and um, even races, and they were kind of using this as, as also a an opportunity to test the product in an open water setting um, because primarily our customers have been like for um, backyard or, or, you know, pools or municipal facilities or something like that with a, a confined area. So the interesting thing, what, what Peter is doing is he actually sets up a little mini course and the size of that course is generally within the range of the, 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 the hub and, and trackers can, can uh, communicate with each other. So, we've been we've been kind of just testing that out and it's been i think added a lot of value to their team and, and their open water program and also um provide a lot of just like an extra layer of of safety and security for the parents who when he first started doing that was getting a lot of questions about like well you know I, how many coaches to you know how many coaches are going to be keeping their eyes on the swimmers and how far from shore are they going and how clear is the water and you know obviously that there are you know, inherent safety concerns um, that open water brings that are just uh, in addition to what you're, what you get in a pool. Um, and there's just no way around that. So we're hoping that we can um, 
that we can find uh, find the the optimal way to use it, this technology in an open water setting. And one of the things that we're kind of thinking about now is, you know, a lot of people that swim open water don't swim around, don't have like buoys and anchors and set up a course and all that stuff. That's that's actually pretty uncommon. Um, so we're just trying to think about, you know, what we would have to do, whether it's a technology modification or um, uh, to, to essentially maybe get this product and, and system to work kind of in a, in a remote capacity where someone in a kayak or a boat might be able to have some kind of hub in it. And, you know, you can go swim across a lake because the kayak is never going to be really that far from, you know, the athletes, you know, swimming around them. So that's one thing we're kind of, we're, we're thinking about um, also just trying to, you know, extend the range of, of the hardware um, and just trying to really support the open water community in addition to, um, you know, just uh, pools um, with, with, with this with this technology. So, and how do uh, what's the website? Um, how do people know more about this? The website. How how did people? What is the website? Oh, so it's Wave DDS. Okay. Com. Okay. Um, and then I've got uh, the social social media. You can follow us on, um, I think it's Wave Drowning Detection on Instagram. I'm looking it up right now. Oh yeah, Wave Drowning Detection. And then Twitter is uh, Wave underscore DDS. Okay. Um, and then Facebook is also Wave DDS. So they're... Got it. Okay. There. Um, you can uh, even just, um, it, you know, if anyone's interested in, in um, you know, bringing this into their, their program or their, or their team or even their home um, or their facility, uh, by all means, reach out to me. I'm happy to, you know, talk you through exactly how it works and, you know, what, what, the, um, what the, you know, product and pricing and everything looks like and, you know, can, can work with you through that. So, so Steve, I'll, I'll give you an email that you can drop in there too. Okay, so. will do. Well, Alex, this has been a fascinating hour. <laughs> it was great yeah. to hear the backstory of your world championship and the story of your victory uh, at Lake St. John, um, capped off Thanks. your career, and what you're doing for the sport in the future. So thank you very much, Alex. It's been a real thank honor. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, it's good, good to catch up with you. All right. Take care. Take care, man. See you.